So, uh, Uti uh, Snellman is the Vice President of the University of the Arctic and Director of International Relations uh, at the University of Lapland in Finland. Welcome to you very much. And uh, Dorte Dahl Janssen, uh, you are the, um, uh, you're an academic at the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. And Anita Palo is a writer uh, focused really on many of the issues that we have been hearing about in terms of technology, education, uh, and sustainability in, in the Arctic region. So Anita, I'm delighted you're with us and let us get our panel discussion going. I, I suppose, uh, Uti, I'll start with you. You um, are a senior player in higher education in Lapland, in, in Finland. To what extent do you believe that your institution and others in the Arctic uh, are su being successful in terms of, of powering the knowledge base in the Arctic region right now? Thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I have to declare myself a Pollyanna. I just learned a new concept. Um, an, uh, yes, uh, yes. A, an inveterate optimist. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, um, I think, I think uh, looking at what's been happening in the Arctic in the higher education community, uh, there are, there are um, two big or three big trends. One, uh, the traditional disciplines uh, like biology or, or political science. Uh, in, uh, in a way, the, the Arctic is a grand challenge, and we've learned to un we've come to the understanding that the traditional disciplines don't address uh, address the, 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 this grand challenge in the right kind of way. So universities are reacting by changing their structures from disciplinary in structures into mm. interdisciplinary structures. So that's one, that's one trend. And the other one is, is, uh, is openness, that there is more and more push for open collaboration, from, from competition to collaboration, open science, open data, sharing, sharing of knowledge, and then, then mobility, the need for co-production, uh, so that, that that the issues are so big that you you really need to try to tackle them together in a, in a in a really often completely unexpected combinations of scientists and students and indigenous leaders and so you can't work in the universities in a traditional way. Uh, my university is um, um, is the 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 center or secretariat also for the U Arctic network which is which was started from the arctic council co uh, context and currently has has 212 member institutions in the arctic and beyond and that's a that's one of the largest university networks in the world it's one of your explicit focuses on trying to keep young people who come to the university and who are from the arctic region in the arctic region when they leave and, I, and do you have tie ups with with businesses with the corporate world to try to encourage them to look for jobs uh, and use their expertise and their skill sets in in the north Absolutely, because of course the North will lose its 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 initial population now if we if the universities don't react and provide the kind of education that the region that the region needs. And that when when talking about relevant education, of course that also needs to be very knowledge based because you can't be be very short sighted about relevant relevant education. You have to do you have to do research on okay what are the what are the trends for example uh, you know. How are the mobility patterns going to change the actual demographics of the de demographics of the region? So these universities are really joining together to look at the look at these issues and trying to trying to, trying to make it possible for young people mm. to leave and also change the somehow the feeling that okay you you don't lose out if you stay in the north uh, that you actually so that empowerment is very much at the core of this whole initiative okay thank you very much for that uh, Dorte, I, I i want to ask you we're talking about knowledge here and we'll get on to a business perspective and get back to here soon but but in terms of uh research and, and academics and using the latest knowledge we have, much of it driven, of course, by science, by an understanding of what is happening to the Arctic as an environment. Um, how do you balance out cutting-edge 
scientific research, the latest academic knowledge against the you know, centuries, maybe even millennia old knowledge that exists in the far north, in, in the indigenous communities, in their traditions, in their histories, in their stories, and in their way they approach the nurturing of this place. Is it inevitable that, that less and less emphasis is going to be put on that indigenous knowledge? Well, I think the, the indigenous knowledge is, is more important than ever. You know, to, to have this perspective that goes further back in time, that the last uh, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, we've been able to observe in, in our more scientific ways, I think we would get nowhere if we don't include all the knowledge there is in, in the northern communities. But what if that what knowledge is, is based on a... Uh, well, to put it bluntly, on an environment that is rapidly changing and that no longer exists in the way that traditional knowledge perceives it. That's why the, the northern people also need us, uh, because we, we, we have other ways of, of observing and, and we try to account for the changes. So it is the, 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 the communication, the collaboration uh, between the, 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 the scientific community and the northern uh, populations that will really make the difference. And is that really working well? Or do indigenous communities often feel that they're talked over or that their, their voice isn't really heard? Well, I think in most cases they are talked over, so I think it's a true feeling. But it's certainly something that needs to change. Um, research should be led by the communities. Data should be owned by the communities. And it's something that we need to adapt to and change to. And I think it's a great challenge because many of the communities are very small. For example, up in Arctic Canada, and the settlements are very small. Often you have 100 people, 200 people. And they're also worried about all the researchers coming to the community because they don't have enough people to work with the communities. So to get, to get the collaboration going and to get the things Things working is, 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 is a challenge from both sides. Yeah. Anita, on, on this, w w I wonder whether you feel that there is an imbalance right now in where, you know, the, 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 the knowledge base, the science, the research knowledge is being used, who it's benefiting in the far north and whether that needs to change. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, my area was federal Indian law. I'm a non-Indian person. Uh, I recently, two months ago, came back from Savunga, uh, St. Lawrence Island, off of the coast of Alaska, closer to Russia. Um, and in response, I actually think Native voices are getting louder uh, and more powerful and more profound. Uh, and uh, certainly a question in terms of uh, what kind of integration uh, into the discourse. Uh, uh, surely, uh, as equals, Native people should be included as young people, as Native people, as all various persons who have been coastal people who have been marginalized uh, by the processes uh, that are defining the shape of our, of our uh, presence and, and future. And the three, if I may say, three specific philosophical um, elements that I, I learned uh, from Savunga was the view of leaving no footprint behind when you leave this earth, uh, that you leave no footprint behind, uh, that you take only what you need and not more, and, uh, and that uh, you do not dominate nature. We, the human species does not dominate or should not dominate nature, but view ourselves as a part of it. And I think that it's not so much that what existed 2,000 years ago uh, uh, when, when there was an ice bridge or even a millennia uh, uh, could be applied uh, today. It's what is the thinking uh, that allowed for the navigation of the various changes uh, in, in, uh, in the terrain and architecture and climate, et cetera. How does one navigate successfully, including today? And uh, so I think uh, that uh, the, the more the more voice that's included and 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 uh, uh, and, and respected uh, uh, and, uh, defined, it, it, yeah, and no, defining that, that, not to be brought in but to be part of. That's fascinating the way you've laid it out. You're saying it, it's not just a question of specific sort of bodies of knowledge. It's about a mindset, an approach to uh, the relationship between you know, we human beings and our, our environment Absolutely. that matters. I get that. But you also said that you think that indigenous voices count for more than they ever had before, or louder than they've been. But uh, being loud is one thing. Are they having an impact in a way that they haven't before? Well, uh, who, who is having an impact? Uh, I mean, we have a crisis of capitalism uh, that we are engaged in at the moment. We have um, 
nationalist populist movements uh, going on around the world uh, who, are, who are making challenges to the orthodoxies uh, that have existed. Well, so I and guess your answer is no. So, so the answer voices is, may be louder, but they're not really having well, the, an impact. The young people here were making a very profound statement. Uh, various peoples who have been marginalized from processes for one reason or another uh, are, I think, articulating in a more organized, profound way and breaking through uh, some of the limitations right. that have existed. Uh, so I actually look at things optimistically. Okay. Well, the, we've got various optimistic and even Pollyanna-ish perspectives. <laughs> but what we've laid out so far is fascinating. And I want to now bring it back to you two who have a you know, government perspective and a, and a corporate sort of business profit-oriented perspective. So here, you know, are two concepts that Anita just put forward that have long been... Uh, sort of core principles of indigenous approach to to life in the far north, that is, leave no footprint, don't dominate nature. Hand on heart, Kongsberg, with its big economic activity in, in the Arctic region, is it living up to those philosophies? And is, is, is science and, and technology allowing you to do things that far from leaving no footprint and not dominating nature mean that you leave a bigger footprint and dominate nature more than you ever have before. I think we wouldn't be sitting here if we didn't uh, cause some of these footprints <coughs> as an industry, of course, but I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the technology uh, is a part of the answer here. We, first, of, first and foremost, we need more knowledge. Uh, we need to know uh, and understand how these are impacting not only the Arctic, but uh, the total globe. And then it, we need to find new uh, methods. We need to find new technology. It was mentioned in the last uh, earlier panel here that we need uh, new technology that we have not uh, been mm. taught about yet. Uh, and and uh, definitely Kongsberg, we, we uh, look at uh, ourselves as a uh, part of the solution, uh, you know, to find tomorrow's solutions for making a more sustainable world. And of course, to do that, we... But I don't think there's a business on the planet who doesn't say that. No, it's no, but I think it's not a contradiction, you know, uh, whether you... Uh, for us, it's of course, if you're going to have an engagement, you need business. That's... You need funding. Uh, and we think... And you need profit. And you need profit. And, 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 and you know, frankly, when you're utilising the latest uh, scientific developments to, to expand your business, your first motivation is profit, surely. Well, I think it's, it's both. It's, uh, uh, we are, as anybody else, concerned about the climate today. But we can contribute, we can make that uh, have an impact by supplying technology that make that uh, impact as little as possible. Unfortunately, we don't have the ultimate solution for everything today. Mm. But I think uh, by getting more knowledge, by cooperating more, this is not one part that can, that can uh, uh, handle this. It has to be, uh, you know, uh, the whole entire community uh, the academia, the government, the industry. So to what extent are you listening to the voices, you know, the kinds of voices we, we have on this panel, voices from academia, from uh, universities, from environmental groups uh, and campaign organizations? Are you now routinely consulting a much wider, I hate the word, but a much wider sort of breadth of stakeholders? Every day. We are cooperating with uh, the institutes, uh, we are cooperating with the universities, we are cooperating with the governments every day. Uh, uh, and um, I think that is the only way we can actually solve uh, the problem, is to communicate together and share data. Uh, you know, today there is too much silos sitting and doing science and research by themselves. I think that we can achieve much greater thing and faster if we could share uh, the knowledge and the data among mm. the universities, among the industries, among the research institutes. Uh, we are doing it, but we can do it to a much greater extent than we are doing today. Right. Uh, Minister, you, you uh, represent uh, a country which has a significant portion of its territory in, in the Arctic North, and you have expanded economic activity up there, including major mines and steel production and this and that, and you have big ambitions to take that much further. You, to what extent 
do you truly believe you can do all that without having damaging impacts upon the sustainability of of the Arctic North and and you know on on, on the protection of its unique quality as a as a you know unspoiled area well human activities affects nature uh, that's sort of a fact so there's a <laughs> there is a, a trade off you, uh, at the very beginning we uh, have to accept there is a trade off i want to i want to return to uh, uh, the what the emerging leader said uh, said earlier today and also the chairman on the regional youth parliament mm -hmm. Because I think we have to remember that uh, people in, in the Arctic region, as people all over the world, they have the same right to, uh, to development, to, uh, to get their education, to have good jobs that they uh, feel that they can build their future around. And I think that we have a... We have a a special opportunity here up north uh, in the cooperation and the co collaborations that we all that we already have uh, in the Arctic region, and we are we are countries with quite good of resource, resources when it comes to to uh, to research, when it comes to education, when it comes to industries and and cooperation and and politics as well. So I think I, I wanted to try to say that in in my keynote that. If we we have a we have a chance here in 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 Arctic to actually try to create something that uh, the rest of the world can uh, can lean on and learn from. If we if we if we try to collo collaborate even more uh, closely with industry, academia, and politics, but with the with with the Sort of with the people who actually live here, and well, but, but and we have and we have and I think we have, I think we have something that that uh, other parts of the world can can learn from because we have to do it here but because the of is, the climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so but but the, here's a, just a very basic thing. You're a politician. You need to win elections. What proportion of your population in Sweden lives actually in the Arctic? Well, I think that's also a difference w between the Arctic regions, because in Sweden we have the county of Norrbotten and the county of Westerbotten. Mm. Uh, here we have universities, we yeah, have but, a rich what, population, uh, no, we I, have I, I industries, that. minings and so on. So but ultimately, as a, as a proportion of your overall population, what, what, what is the, you know, the, the percentage of people who live in the far north in the Arctic? In no, Sweden. but of course the the relations in Sweden as in many other countries we have more people living in the south. No, no, I country. know you do, but I just want to, I'm, I'm just genuinely interested. Yeah. What, what is the what are the figures? What, what proportion of your population lives in the in the Arctic North? I can't give you an exact figure. Ah. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, in my point of view, but, I mean, uh, you, you, in my point of view, uh, we are a, we are all a part of the Swedish country and a part of the Arctic region and we have to see that even even if people are if, if you're living in up north in Sweden or south of Sweden mm -hmm. you have the si same right to education and to build your future in that place and me, me being a politician I have to address these issues in slightly different ways, but also in, in a kind and also, uh, also very much original ways that are exceptionally good, I would say, if, within but, but, the Arctic region, because right. we have this, we have a, an opportunity. But, but I do think do there's something good. interesting here about the interface between politics and, and science and business. Uh, you know, the the politician in the end, you know, is a national figure if he's in, she or he is in government and they have to think about the good of the whole country. But proportionally, most uh, in the Arctic, most population centres are not in the Arctic. They're much further south in those countries. So my question to all of you, and perhaps Uta, you can answer this one, is the degree to which you think uh, national governments in the Arctic countries are using... The, the knowledge base and the technological innovations and, and all of that in a way that it really is in the best interests of the Arctic or whether oftentimes there is a perspective which doesn't necessarily get driven by the, the, the needs and the best interests 
of the of the northern populations? Um, I'm not sure that I I fully s sort of agree with you. That so my notion there might be a north-south divide uh, oftentimes in the Arctic. Of course, region. there has been. There's been a really strong north-south divide in the Arctic countries, but it's becoming less and less so. So that, but but in the end, I would again go back to the earlier discussion of, about traditional knowledge and kind of an in, indigenous people. I think mean, why aren't there they? If that was the topic, why aren't there? At, why aren't they at the table? Mm. So. I'm not even comfortable talking about that as, as like, like the expert. I would just say that, yes, the structures have changed. We've actually really changed the things in the Arctic so that we, we actually want them to be with us and we want the youth to be with us and we don't, we just completely mixed everything up. So, 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 you know, the world isn't as colonized as it used to be. Mm. And, and, and the Arctic Council has had a really, really big role to play in that in the, in the past, uh, in the past 20 years. But then at the, I'd like to go back to the, the some of the solutions mm. that, of course, openness of of everything openness of data open, op, open science and open access to education that that does empower the north it will it, it potentially also empowers the global south mm. that actually the things that we do the, the innovations we do in the rich north uh, because the, the Arctic countries really are quite rich compared to globally, uh, then they become, the, you know, th they help the whole world rather than just some, uh, somehow us possessing well, that knowledge. That, that and, actually, uh, if I may say so, is a brilliant, maybe conscious or not, but a brilliant segue into having a, a, a perspective from one of our Outlook contributors, um, Paul Berkman, because Paul is at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and he's been and actively does think can write about the degree of, of sort of cooperation across Arctic countries when it comes to the knowledge base, to science and research, and in particular the way in which uh, even when politics is, is perhaps tense and difficult amongst nation states in other parts of the world, the Arctic tries to maintain a spirit of cooperation and collaboration. So, uh, Paul, I won't want to preempt your words. Over to you. We are entering a world with 8 billion people this decade, inhabiting a globally interconnected civilization aligned with changes on a planetary scale, recognizing that human population has skyrocketed over 400% since World War I, one century ago in the lifetimes of our oldest living relatives. Crossing thresholds unlike any in human history, considering our, go our common future, there is great responsibility for decisions that operate in the face of change. With such responsibility that belongs to all of us, science diplomacy has been accelerating as an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process involving informed decision making to balance national interests and common interests for the benefit of all on Earth across generations. To restate the obvious, at the levels of peoples, nations, and our world, there is a continuum of urgencies to address from security timescales, mitigating the risks of political, economic, and cultural instabilities that are immediate, to sustainability timescales, balancing environmental protection, economic prosperity, and societal well-being across generations. With this observation, introducing definition to avoid jargon, informed decisions operate across a continuum of urgencies. Children and even young adults living today, our children and grandchildren, will be alive in the 22nd century. As a scalable proposition, for each of us as individuals, the continuum of urgencies is like driving on any road, constantly adjusting to the surrounding vehicles and circumstances while being alert to the red lights ahead and traffic behind. The Arctic that we can observe and measure is crossing environmental thresholds where there are boundaries of systems are changing. In the ocean and on land, with the sea ice and permafrost respectively, these environmental state changes are unambiguous. In the Arctic today, now, and without projecting into the future, the risks of instabilities are inherent with these marine and terrestrial ecosystems. Fortunately, we have science, which can be characterized as the study of change, with international and interdisciplinary inclusion involving the natural sciences and social sciences, as well as indigenous knowledge. 
all of which characterize patterns, trends, and processes, albeit with different methodologies, that become the bases for decisions. Informed decision making starts with questions, where each of us has the capacities to contribute as both observers and participants, <laughs> convening dialogues among allies and adversaries alike to build common interests. There also is opportunity to champion the momentum of the common Arctic issues of sustainable development and environmental protection established by the eight Arctic states and six indigenous peoples organizations with the Arctic Council in their 1996 Ottawa Declaration. Arctic sustainability involves governance mechanisms highlighted by the three binding agreements that have emerged from the Arctic Council task forces since 2009. With the Arctic Economic Council, there also is recognition about the fundamental importance of built infrastructure, which is characterized by technology and capitalization with goods, services, and markets. Together, the sustainability of the Arctic as elsewhere on Earth involves effective coupling between the governance mechanisms and the built infrastructure. The Arctic is special for humanity, introducing hope and inspiration with the North Pole as a pole of peace, as envisioned by Mikhail Gorbachev in his famous 1987 Murmansk speech. Our common journey to operate across a continuum of urgencies fundamentally involves next generations on a global scale, stimulating educational initiatives like the University of the Arctic, evolving as a globally interconnected civilization with knowledge and lessons of the 20th century, that nationalism breeds global conflict. Together, we can contribute to informed decision making, balancing national interests and common interests to develop the Arctic for the benefit of all on Earth across generations. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> Uh, just, just to say, I, I, I actually want to bring uh, Uti in if I can. Paul's talking about um, the urgency of, of science diplomacy. Uh, he's talking about greater instability, which we all see around us. And I'm not thinking now politics, but I'm thinking environmental as well. Uh, and he's thinking about the degree to which, you know, I, educators and technologists and scientists have to step up to the plate. Is enough of that happening right now for us to sit here and be content and satisfied and thinking that, you know what, the Arctic is, is, is doing its bit? Um, of course, not enough is being done. We wouldn't have any problem if, if enough was being done. But there's, a, there's in a way, a massive movement to, to do something. Paul Bergman, for example, he's the lead of a UArctic thematic network on science diplomacy, which is having a tremendous in the impact on the dialogue. But at the same time, there are lots of other similar groupings, groupings that are actually addressing, uh, addressing, you know, real issues uh, that have to. Well, do I was going to say, di goal. dialogue is enough. one thing, but whether it feeds into real decisions made by, for example, big businesses with a big footprint in the region. I would say Arctic a lot region. is being done. It's not enough ever, but a lot is being done and uh, and somehow the 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 it's the collaboration is happening and uh, and at, and and through digitalization um, you know things are scalable but at the same time we also need opportunities for face to face contact to to retain this, that people have an understanding. Mm. There's real co-production of knowledge, and students have opportunities to experience other other places in the Arctic. So there, there are a lot of things that are being done, but of course, never enough. I, I have a feeling that there's a great sort of expertise and perspective in the audience and insight that we ought to bring in uh, as quick as we can. So I'm going to ask for hands up. And I told that I, last time I was very bad at noticing hands up on this side of the room. Uh, so to rectify. And women. And you women. Only gave, you gave the word to three or four men. No women. Did I? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I that, the gentleman over there that I just identified, <laughs> he, he's in. Uh, it is a very uh, joking aside. It's absolutely true. I've got to make sure that mm -hmm. women's arms are respected just as much as men's arms. Mm -hmm. So, um, if there are females mm -hmm. who would like to ask a question at this point. Uh, please do. This panel Otherwise, is more female than men. The yeah, other that's one was true. another one around. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for keeping me honest, as they say. But, uh, sir, as I can't see a, a female hand up at this moment, the floor is yours as you've got the microphone. Go for it. 
Hello, uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, Lars Kullerö, UARTIC. I have a question to the industry partner at your floor. Yeah. Um, how can you work with the academia together with your colleagues and other businesses to help us make the governments and yourself contribute enough so that we don't have an OT saying that a lot could, more could be done and it's all, a lot good happens, but not enough. And it's such a marginal cost to bring this Arctic education cooperation together with indigenous peoples to work. And still, we don't have it working. Mm. What can the industry do to make that happen? Can you convince the governments? Yeah, go on. Yeah, what can we do? Um, I think, uh, you know, we are working with, uh, with uh, we call it a Norwegian model, uh, which is basically uh, the government, the academia, the institutes, and the industry working together. Uh, and uh, uh, we have several interaction with the academia, either as sponsors of the, uh, you know, the professorship mm. or, or, or bachelor. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of uh, interaction when it comes to bringing in the youth uh, uh, in the summer program. They are working on our challenges today, uh, the real project, uh, and I think that that gives us kind of inspiration, also the a little bit older guys, you know, uh, you know, to, to look at the, the challenges that we see out there in a different perspective. Um, I think we just need to, you know, uh, continue to work uh, with the academia. We need education. We need uh, the young guys to actually um, look at it in a different way. Uh, then, uh do, do you f need more? I mean, more um, applied and practical. Uh, R&D solutions to come out of higher education and less pure science. Would you say that at the moment, you know, the balance is good or it's not quite right? Speaking from the point of view of, of a business leader. I, I think it, it's actually going on. Uh, there is a lot of innovation and, and you see uh, a lot of especially smart, uh, smaller uh, startups. Uh, I think the problem and as our as a corporate uh, company, I think we need to um, be more uh, focused on, on the smaller uh, and medium-sized uh, companies. Mm. We are working with 2,000 uh, sub-suppliers in Kongsberg, uh, but I think every, uh, in, in, uh, or every company has to look at these smaller startups, very often young people, thinking of tomorrow's solutions in a different way than, than uh, we that is established in the industry today. Mm. And I think that's where the summer program, you know, the interaction with academia, and I think also the young people actually need to, you know, now and then come and be in the industry uh, and not just sit on the school bench, uh, so to say. So the interaction should be more frequently between the industry and the academia. Yes, I wonder if... Uh, do, uh, if I may attest yes. to the Norwegian model, um, I, I think it's uh, remarkable, personally. And uh, when I was in Namibia uh, working on a project that had to do with offshore uh, coastal uh, questions and petroleum development in particular in fishing er areas, uh, the highest level of government people talked about the Norwegian model. And I was a Fulbright two years ago in Iceland. And uh, there was discussion with Norway, as you know, in the uh, Jan Mayen, whether there would be uh, petroleum development with Sinuk of China at that point. And uh, what the, uh, uh, I was stationed in the National Energy Authority, Mark and, uh, and people were talking about the incorporation more and more of the Norwegian model. Uh, but I'm intrigued. I, I need, what did they mean by that? You know, uh, very briefly, what did they mean when they referred with admiration to this Norwegian model? What well, were they thinking of? As I understood it, uh, it, one had to do with the incorporation of stakeholders, uh, you know, different interests uh, that were in the footprint of operations, or perhaps not even in the footprint, perhaps in the, in the nation itself, and that there was an incorporation uh, into the thinking that the model, I don't know if it's in your instance, included on the board members of labor, members of environment, members of various uh, constituencies who are not classical bottom line uh, uh, stakeholders. And uh, also uh, that, uh, and Greenpeace may disagree with me uh, given the litigation that's ongoing, but uh, that the, uh, the attention to the 
environmental considerations uh, of the impacts and implications of ac action and activity uh, 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 taken into consideration, and finally and not least, uh, the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. I think it's a trillion dollars at the moment, um, which uh, moves back to community so that there's an improvement uh, uh, in, in whether it's education or schools, et cetera, and, and if I'm not speaking for Iceland for sure, so forgive me anybody, but um, just to say that there was a discussion of um, uh, distributive justice and offshore natural resources development, which emerged out of the discussions and, and the interactions um, uh, with Norway. Right. I, I just yeah, go on quickly, Minister. Yeah. yeah, quickly, because I'm still on the spot when you are trying to put a frame on sort of, I think you have a sort of a dystopic uh, uh, way of thinking when you want to put this on, on a frame where it is where it's, where it's something that we come back between north and south and... Uh, Are you trying to say I'm full, I'm full of negativity? Yeah, yeah oh. I think you were a little bit negative there. Because <laughs> I, I, but I want to say, of course, we don't neglect the challenges. But because I, I said it in my keynote, that we are we're living in a more polarized world. But I don't think it's so easy to that you only can say it's between north and south. It's between countries, people, it's, between, it's within cities, it's within regions. And um, I, 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 don't, I know the mayor of the county of Westerbotten will probably be angry with me, but, but if we say we have, um, if we look upon Sweden, we have sort of half a million or something people in the county of Norrbotten and the county of Westerbotten. Uh, and we have two universities in that region, uh, and, and we put, if we look upon the countries within the Arctic, Arctic region, we are countries that put in a lot of money according to our GDP in research, for example, uh, and we, we are countries who believe uh, in, um, in, in cooperation and collaboration. So, of course, there are challenges that we... That of course, we can't neglect mm. the challenges. That's what I said in my keynote. But, uh, but I want to address future, and I think we have the ob obligation to address future, that we actually can solve them together and that we have a great opportunity within the Arctic region, because here... We need to do it right now because the challenges are so big. Uh, so that's so that's something because I had I think you had a little well, bit. Well, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm sorry that you oh. find me to be Mr. Yeah. Negative. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, 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 sorry. I, I, and, but uh, it and is I'm sort sorry of my I don't know the exact <laughs> figure, but uh, I but uh, it's, sort of it's sort of my uh, job uh, to challenge you, <laughs> some of the the, the consensus. Because, because if you yes, you look upon climate change, we can all sort of uh, yes to dig a pit and and go and say. No, we can't manage at all. Well, we, not, uh, we can do nothing. We yes. can't do that because it's we're not, our future. No, we're definitely not yeah. going to dig a pit no. and throw no. ourselves into no, it. No, into a pit. But, but no. we are, I, I'm now going uh, Daughter, I'll tell you what. I haven't heard from you for a bit, so you tell me what you wanted to say, <laughs> and then I'm going to uh, introduce <laughs> our female. other uh, brief outlook speaker on, on the side there. But you go for it first, Daughter. I, I'll make it very brief. Yeah. I just want to be, you know, draw the attention to the Arctic is big. Mm. We should talk about North America. We should talk about Russia. Yes. We should talk about Greenland too. Indeed. And I think the you know conditions are different if you move to the other places of the Arctic. Yeah. And you asked before best interest in the Arctic. Yeah. I think a lot of things that have happened are absolutely not in the best interest in the Arctic. A lot of pollution has happened in this area. Most of the industry moving in there haven't done it for the interest of the Arctic, but for exploration of oil, for example. And I think we have a lot to amend. We have a lot to move to the Arctic. We have to involve the Arctic and we have to hear their opinion on how things should go forward and they should be the ones that benefit from, from this business right. in the Arctic. And education is very poor in many areas because they, it's so remote. So it might be good in, in Sweden and Norway, but I think there I are think areas where we need to do a lot. I think that's an excellent point. And again, it rather seamlessly allows me to introduce our next um, Outlook speaker um, because... There is no doubt that when it comes to the economic potential of the far north of the Arctic, particularly one could say in a uh, country like Russia, um, there is an enormous potential for further fossil fuel exploitation and extraction. But whether that is in the best interests of local communities, um, 
the sustainability agenda, both in the north but in the wider, uh, you know, planetary context, is another matter. So I'm going to introduce Annika Nielsen. She's a researcher at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and she's been pondering whether all of the stuff we've been talking about, the commitment to sort of knowledge-based economies in the far north, whether it's truly focused on one key aspect, which is the transition away from fossil fuels, or whether that's a difficult subject to broach. So take it away, Annika. Yeah, we heard a lot about we need to address the issue of climate change. Well, we need to address the cause of climate change, I would say. And in the Arctic, like the rest of the world, we must move away from fossil fuels. Not only the use, but also the production of fossil fuels. This will not be easy in the Arctic, given the national interest at stake. But I will not talk about national interests and geopolitics today. And instead focus on knowledge and decision making related to non-fossil energy sources. And because that's what's going to come next. Uh, Non-fossil energy also requires resources. The expansion of wind energy in the Arctic creates demands for access to land that sometimes have other uses already and where they collide with other uses. Many green technologies rely on minerals, rare earth minerals, that require mining. This has increased the interest in opening new mines in the Arctic as well as a push for speeding up the decision-making processes related to mining. At the same time, protests are mounting against new mining activities. The reason is that mines, similar to the expansion of wind power, creates conflicts over land use. The Arctic is not an empty space. We've heard that many times here. We have other activities that value reindeer herding. We have tourism and safeguarding essential ecosystem functions. Knowledge will be essential for making sure that the necessary push away from fossil fuels does not lead to energy production systems with negative effects on sustainable development locally in the long run. But whose knowledge should count when assessing the consequences? Who should decide what is important when the decisions are made? If we want smooth decision-making, which industry asks for, the knowledge production and decision-making processes must be seen as legitimate also by those who have to live by, for the consequences locally in relation to local impacts and pollution. Today, the processes are of use for assessing impacts of new industrial ventures are often criticized. One reason is that not knowledge is considered relevant or equally included. Another is that assessments are made piecemeal, project by project, without attention to cumulative impacts. While the knowledge input in detail might be high quality and very good, system perspectives and multiple pressures and erosion of resilience are missing. We know from the past that national and global interest in the Arctic resources have played a fundamental role for shaping many northern societies. Investments have created path dependencies with long-term consequences relating to economic, social and technical structures, demography someone mentioned in the, in the session earlier. We know that climate change will have profound impacts on Arctic environments and societies. The implications of new energy infrastructures could be just as profound. We have been encouraged to end with a question to, for the panel, and my question is, how do we ensure that knowledge processes and impact analysis that are considered legitimate by all relevant parties and include attention to the potential long-term and large-scale system changes that could profoundly affect the sustainability of the transition away from fossil fuels and to non-fossil fuel energy systems? Right. Well, thank you very much, Annika. I think that's a very interesting perspective and an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> so who, who, who would like to take this on? Annika's question in essence is whether the, the sort of knowledge-based community, the knowledge processes have yet really embraced the need to truly disengage from fossil fuels and look at new energy sources, new ways of doing things in, in the north. May I? Um, thank you. A remarkable presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, three months or so ago, there was a meeting in uh, Shanghai in China uh, that was the Arctic uh, uh, Circle, may I say, and, uh, and China. And uh, one of the things that was discussed very much uh, was the issue of energy and transitions, uh, energy transitions. And China had uh, a situation where 
I think somehow something like 200,000 people a year die uh, from inhaling um, noxious atmosphere. And uh, apparently uh, a, a relationship has now been developed, formalized um, uh, in writing an agreement between China and Iceland and uh, co uh, geothermal has been uh, developed in 17 locations, and I think 60 cities are developing geothermal. And the idea being, um, take a long time, but someday to shut down the coal-fired uh, plants. And uh, in the course of engaging in an economic activity, um, they, uh, in a commercial uh, activity, also they have uh, merged together two of their uh, science and research centers, uh, one in Beijing and the other in um, Reykjavik. And mm. uh, the idea being to um, to uh, it m move this uh, as far as it'll go, and I don't think there are any limits viewed, and it's not necessarily that it would only be China um, that um, uh, that uh, could work cooperatively in the development of uh, of uh, green technologies. And but interesting uh, that that's China that working yeah, with well, Iceland. Well, they've got the money uh, and they've yeah. got the death uh, death count uh, growing. Yes. And and China, um, sorry, uh, and uh, Iceland has the technology and the know. How. So when you put the two together, you get a pretty impressive uh, process, uh, which which is, uh, um, as we know, most of the of the climate issues uh, that are impacting the Arctic region aren't coming from the Arctic region. Uh, so uh, in a certain sense, it's an ambassadorial um, almost uh, relationship of, of saying that we we are suffering uh, from the changes in the, our region in the region uh, as a result of what's happening elsewhere for pretty much and. And, uh, and we can be part of solving the problem because we're on the front lines mm. and mm. technologically we're pretty good at what we do. Mm. Uh, Gear, I, I, I'm going to get back to questions after this, but Gear, I just wonder whether you, with your sort of business leader hat on, think that actually it's true that in much of the Arctic region, the, the thinking, you know, whether it be academic or whether it be uh, science and, and technologists, the thinking hasn't been radical enough about the need to move beyond uh, fossil fuels. I think, uh, unfortunately, I think we have to live with the fossil fuel for many years. Uh, Do you I say that as a Norwegian who sees that it's in your country's interest to say, put it that way? No, I just, the world will need energy uh, going forward. And, you know, to stop the fossil fuel, uh, I'm not seeing how we could survive, actually, uh, without that uh, as a part of... Uh, and then, luckily, we see that, the, you know, the, the, the research, the, the investment in renewable energy is increasing day by day. Uh, and it's also good for business. Uh, I mean, mm. every company with respect for itself has the green initiatives these days. Uh, every time I go for a roadshow and meet investors, they are talking about environment, governments, and uh, social uh, responsibility. And, and that has changed only the last year, I would say, uh, increasingly attention around uh, ESG. Um, we definitely need to um, continue, or we're definitely going to have uh, fossil fuel going forward. But we can de do it in a more sustainable way. We need to we need to analyze data. We need to get more, uh, I would say, uh, people to look at it from different angles, and we can then make solutions which uh, make uh, the mm. fossil fuel less uh, polluting or, or uh, having a you know less uh, cl climate. Fuel. Right. So you're saying that there has two fundamental tracks of, of science and research. One has to be to make the residual and continuing use of fossil fuel ever cleaner and less damaging, and the other has to be to really focus very hard on how to maximize the potential of, of non, uh, renewables, Renewable, non-fossil yeah. fuel. Yeah. Does that I, okay, may, may I add, uh, because China is a very good example, and I've been living in China, and, and I see what China is doing now on the hydrogen. I mean, they are mm. uh, investing heavily in hydrogen, and of course, using the uh, tree gorges, uh, you know, the big uh, yes. dam there, and, and they are today wasting the hydrogen, and now they are looking at how to utilize that uh, hydrogen to produce energy. Mm. So they are heavily investing, and they have to do it. But right. People are dying. dying. <laughs> I think it's the biggest problem in China is actually the environmental uh, issue. Indeed, which is a huge imperative to change things. 
Daughter, hold your thought for just a sec, because I think uh, we don't have that much time left, and I do want to get some more questions in from our audience. There's a gentleman there, but I am determined to yes, look at the back me. and look for women. Hello. Ah, a, a, a woman's hand has been raised over there. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am, and we'll get the microphone to you. I will come to you, sir. I'm not ruling out men. I'm just keen to keep the balance. Thank you. Um, this is a question for whoever wants to answer it from the panel. Um, in the last panel, we talked about, some, somebody mentioned that industry is not the villain. Uh, and so I'm curious to hear from the panel, if industry is not the villain in the context of what we know about increasing in average temperatures, decreasing in sea ice, decreasing in endangered species in the Arctic, can you name the villain? Because clearly there is a villain here. <laughs> oh, the consumer. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, well, right. let's have a concise take on where the, the villainy is. You're saying that all of us, consumers. Yeah, maybe we could consume a little less. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, anybody else want to give their view? No, but I I don't know if we if we achieve anything by uh, sort of uh, blaming each other if it's industry if it's uh, consumers or whatever. But we know that we we don't live a life in a sustainable way for the moment, and we need to do more. And I think uh, one way of of addressing it is, of course, a political way where we have to uh, put forward legislation and rules and 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 all those things to make to 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 take a path on in a more sustainable way. We have to put money into knowledge and research and innovations to uh, to innovate and, and find new ways of doing things uh, and so on. So I, uh, of course, uh, we that's why we're here. We know that. Uh, uh, the world isn't changing quick enough into a sustainable uh, living. Uh, but I... Con, con, con. <laughs> in, but I believe that we actually can uh, make it happen yeah. to, to put ourselves in a more sustainable living. Uh, and that's how I address it. Good. Uh, well, it's good to hear a, a, a politician yeah. who, who <laughs> continues to have faith in, in both your own and the voters' abilities to adapt to change as is needed and as urgently Hopefully. needed. Uh, yeah, Uti. What, what, I think we are educating uh, a generation of young people who actually are ready and willing to give up the notion of growth, endless growth, because right. it's, that en it's that demand for endless growth that is the villain. And it's kind of like sitting there in between us. It's not any of us, but it's somehow there. So I think young people are somehow, now they see that that's, that's the villain. Uh, do you, do you, do you, as a, an elected politician, do you agree with that, that something fundamental is changing and the next generation... No, but it's the same when I, well, as I said in my keynote. Yes, we have young people being for Runners. We have our own in Sweden, Greta Thunberg, who's done an amazing job uh, forming sort of this uh, environmental movement throughout the world. But at the same time, we have youngsters in, in Sweden, I'm so, and I know there, there are in, in the other Arctic countries as well, who doesn't care at all. Mm. Because this is what we are facing. It's a, it's a polarized world, and we have to never... We have to handle that in a wise and good way. And in my point of view, I, f I see knowledge and research and innovation as not only solutions to, to climate change and other things, but also something that if we, if we use it right, it can also bring hope and, and trust in the future uh, and bring people together in a better way than today. And I think that the Ar Arctic region, mm. with our challenges, but also our way of collaboration with its good and bad uh, um, sort of things, we have the opportunity to do something good together. Okay, good. Uh, I, I am going to come to you now, sir, because you've been <laughs> in, incredibly consistent in your raising of the arm and readiness for your question. So here, here you go. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm Chief Gary Harrison from Chickaloon, Alaska. I'm the traditional chief of uh, some of our people. And... Uh, I just wanted to address uh, something from the last panel. There is a sovereignty dispute in Alaska. Some of us indigenous people dispute the sovereignty of the United States. And we dispute that they did not sell Alaska. Uh, Russia did not. 
because the United States and Great Britain both when they claimed sovereignty, disputed that. But that's only one of the things I wanted to say. Well, but uh, that's also, fascinating, but I'm not sure it plays really Yes, into, it does, because does it? what I'm going to say next no. is that in the Arctic Human Development Report, it shows that uh, much of the resources are leaving the North, and the people of the North are not... Um, receiving the benefit of mm. the resources. Yet we still receive the pollution and the stuff left behind. Many people think Alaska is pristine. The miners have been there for over 200 years. It is not pristine. There is a lot of pollution in Alaska. And uh, when you talk about the indigenous people and their voices, well, it took me a long time to get heard here. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is when we talk about not wanting some of the salmon streams destroyed by the mining and some yeah. of the other things going on in this world, they do not listen. So I have to agree with some of the people who say, no, we're not being listened to. And when we do talk about things, they just say, Oh, and I just wonder how many more salmon streams are there left for them to destroy before we won't have food production in many parts of the world. Yeah. Alaska is one of the largest salmon producing but, areas, and they still want to ruin some of the largest salmon producing areas. Well, that's so. really interesting. Gary, you, I, I think I might have mentioned this in a previous Arctic Frontiers, but I went out to Alaska to cover one of the big mine plans that was going to affect the Bristol Bay area and the salmon runs. I, I, did that mine get refused in the end? Well, it's an uh, interesting development because since Trump's been in there, he's uh, he, he met with the Governor Dunleavy, and they have... Uh, Relaxed all of the environmental things, and they've uh, there's renewed interest in that mine. Is there? So, right. Yes. So, 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 it's going to have to be our last thought. And thank you so much for the input. But you know, we we've been wrestling throughout this panel with the degree to which uh, this idea of of building up the knowledge economy in the north is is really going to translate into different business practices. Is going to lead to a, a, a true sustainability in in the development of the far north. And and then we we hear grievous sort of doubts that that the fine words are going to turn into you know, equally fine action. I just would like some... Uh, there's been a lot of positivity on this panel. I'd like some, you know, sense that you you take that on board, but despite it, do you, you still remain absolutely convinced that, that <laughs> the positive outlook is the right outlook? I don't I don't know how I how I got here, but uh, no, but uh, <laughs> well, it's too late now. Uh, You've been here for but, an hour and a uh, half. Uh, <laughs> no, but but sort of uh, this is true, and sort of uh, uh, politics, elections, voters, businesses not uh, doing the sort of most sustainable choice every time people not doing the sustainable most sustainable choice every time we that 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 is sort of reality and that's why i think we have to focus on things that we can agree on and 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 can give us a push forward and then i'm back to knowledge research and innovation because i i think this is a path when when where we can join together put our forces together into that and hopefully strive for a better future that's how i look upon it mm, yeah. all right anybody else want a final thought on this yeah i i have two two uh, components of my my personal optimism and one is the youth and i don't think that we're teaching them i think they're teaching us and, uh, and the second are uh, groups such as the mayor's, uh, Arctic Mayor's uh, Council mm. uh, uh, that is evolving and developing. And uh, there's an, I think uh, that there is a, a view that perhaps the capital cities of Arctic nations are not hearing uh, quite so clearly um, what the uh, articulations and interests are uh, in the Arctic regions. And so it seems to me that uh, it's a very good idea uh, that they're, they're, they're continues to be growth in the kind of uh, intra-Arctic uh, conversation right. and communication. Okay. Uh, I'm going to leave you with the final word then, Dora, because we, we've got to yeah. wrap. So. Well, 
I think uh, one thing is important, that the climate change is happening so rapidly in the north. It's the most rapid climate change we have. And the knowledge we need from the north is so crucial for everyone, not just the people in the north, yeah. but globally. Because the ice is melting, mm. uh, things are changing, and it's going to influence us our all. And I think this is a factor that will give the power to the north. Mm. Mm. I think that's important. Mm. Okay. Well, that's yeah. a nice way of ending. It, mm. it's, a, it's a complex discussion. We've had actually some great insights from our people giving us outlooks, from our uh, audience questions as well. So I thank you all for that. It is time now to take a, a break. I think we're breaking for uh, actually an hour, perhaps 90 minutes, for uh, a decent lunch, a civilized lunch, and then we're all back in here this afternoon. So, ladies and gentlemen, just before you leave, give a big thank you to our panel. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.